We'll reconvene then, if we may. And I'm going to um, begin in prayer. And these are words which may be familiar to you or may be becoming familiar to you. So if you have any of this in your memory, feel free to mumble along. Living God, Jesus calls his followers to seek first your kingdom. Renew us as we make your love known. Release us to share freely together in mission. And rejuvenate us to be fruitful in your service. Give us courage, wisdom and compassion that strengthened with the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may, as the Diocese of Sheffield, both flourish and grow through Christ our Lord. Amen. The plan for the foreseeable future on these days um, will be the pattern of today. Um, I'm going to try each year to recruit a guest speaker of real enlivening calibre to speak on a subject of their choice and I will then try in the afternoon slot to offer something complimentary uh, to that and I was thinking what a great plan it was until about halfway through this morning <laughs> when I found myself thinking, now follow that. Um, this will be less funny, <laughs> by a long way, um, and um, more Bible, actually, by a long way. Um, I'm personally not a poet, and I have to admit to responding viscerally to really very few poets. Um, I have to admit that I don't get R.H. Thomas and I know I will have fallen in the estimation of some of you by saying that. Bits of Shakespeare, bits of John Donne, bits of George Herbert I have come to value, but even that I suspect is an admission of my noddy level appreciation of poetry. On the other hand, as you will know, I am a passionate devotee of the Bible, and since the Bible contains significant amounts of poetry, I have become at least an enthusiast for, if not yet an able interpreter of, biblical poetry, Hebrew poetry. So what I'm proposing to do for the next 45 minutes or so is to offer you a bit of an overview of what Robert Alter, the great Jewish scholar of the Hebrew Bible, has called the art of biblical poetry. Way back in the 1980s, he published a groundbreaking pair of books on what I think of as the literary craftedness of the Bible, two books which remain classics in the field today. And much more recently, very recently, he has completed an astonishing set of translations and commentaries on the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, to massive critical acclaim. You can buy them if you're willing to remortgage your house <laughs> as one collected set of volumes uh, or you can pick them up uh, one by one uh, into the set and I do heartily um, recommend them. And some of you will by now have become used to my insistence that although the Bible is of course always more than carefully crafted literature, it is in fact seldom less than that, and I'll repeat the phrase, of course the Bible is always more than carefully crafted literature, but it is seldom less than that. And if Bishop Stevens right that we tend to commend the Christian faith principally as truth and goodness, 
to the neglect of its beauty, then I think I'm wanting to say we do the same with the Bible. We approach the Bible in terms of its truthfulness and goodness, rather than in terms of its beauty. And just as Bishop Stephen was careful to say, of course, he wasn't meaning to suggest the Christian faith is not true, not good, just urging us to take its beauty more seriously. I want to say the same thing about Scripture. Of course it's true, of course it's good, but let's enjoy, let's savour, let's appreciate and value its beauty. I say that because I think in Scripture, uh, in the providence of God, the form of scriptural texts is a vehicle for its message. Um, its form is suited, fitted to its function. Um, the, the medium is genuinely for scripture often uh, the message. So that anyone who wants to read the Bible fruitfully, profitably, really does need to attend to it as crafted literature, as a collection of crafted texts. And it certainly follows that anyone who has a responsibility for the preaching and teaching of the Bible has a responsibility to do that. So I'm assuming this afternoon, if this is not an area of strength and familiarity in your own ministry, you will be grateful for a bit of help. And that if this really is already for you an area of great strength and familiarity in your ministry, you will be so grateful to hear these things taken seriously that you will bear with me, even if you never hear another new word from me this afternoon. Uh, I'm intending to do two things, uh, so that there'll be two halves to the lecture, as you'll see. Uh, first, I want to offer you an overview of some of the most obvious features of biblical poetry. And then in the light of that, I want to offer you an exposition of one particular poetic text in the Bible, uh, in this case, Psalm 104. I hope that sounds like a good use um, of our time together and a good supplement to uh, what Bishop Stephen was sharing with us before lunch. If you brought a Bible with you, brownie points. If you didn't, I'm going to try to make you wish that you had. <laughs> So, um, first of all then, a bit of an overview of biblical poetry, and in that regard, the most obvious question to ask is, where is poetry to be found in the Bible? That's to say, it's worth noticing that poetic texts are much more a feature of the Hebrew scriptures than they are of the Greek scriptures. Of course, there is poetry in the New Testament, especially in the early chapters of the Gospel of St. Luke, here and there in the epistles, certainly in the Revelation to John. But there aren't poetic books in the New Testament to compare with the Psalms or the Song of Songs or Proverbs or Lamentations. And much of the prophetic literature is poetic and bits of poetry are also indeed embedded in the narrative books uh, of the um, Hebrew Scriptures too, the Pentateuch and the Histories. Uh, and actually that should alert us to the fact that not all biblical poetry is of one kind. The love poetry in the Song of Songs is qualitatively different to the wisdom poetry in Job or the prophetic poetry in Amos. But nevertheless, I think it is true to say that the features I'm about to set out are evident generally and not just in the Psalms, which is where I'm going to consistently uh, try to land them. So I'm going to run through six features of Hebrew poetry in all, um, three of which, in my opinion, generally do survive the process of translation, and three of which generally don't. That's to say, all translation is inevitably an act of interpretation. There really is no such thing as a literal translation. Perfect equivalence is almost never possible in a movement from one language uh, to another. But poetry is of all literature hardest to translate. And part of what makes biblical poetry thoroughly puzzling and demanding for the reader and preacher is the fact that the two most obvious features of English poetry don't get a look in. Most English poetry, and certainly the most accessible kinds of English poetry, not least in our hymn books, depend on two things above all, metre, or rhythm, and rhyme. The king of love, my shepherd, is, 
his goodness faileth never, I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. Eight syllables, seven syllables, eight syllables, seven <coughs> syllables. Neither rhythm, with the possible exception of a certain kind of lament song, the so-called kina rhythm with a three-two meter, neither rhythm in Hebrew poetry nor rhyme is common, let alone essential. So if we can't look for rhyme or rhythm in Hebrew poetry, what can we look for? So here are three features which do nicely survive translation into English, then three which don't. The first and most obvious feature of Hebrew poetry is what an 18th century bishop of Oxford and London called parallelism. No two scholars agree on precisely how many different kinds of parallelism there are, but all are agreed that this is the most common and recognisable feature of biblical poetry. It rests on the observation that although it is possible to find verses here and there, which are made up of three lines, triadic verses, or just one line, monadic verses, it's, it's much, much more common to find verses made up of two lines, in which the second line has a definite relationship to the first. And it's this feature, especially of the Psalms, which accounts, by the way, for the fact that in many places where the Psalms are recited in public worship, in religious communities, in cathedral churches, in parishes, where morning prayer is still an act of public worship, where the appointed Psalm is used in services of Holy Communion, it has become customary to pause halfway through each verse. It works. It works because there is usually a definite halfway point to the verse and because it gives the reader a moment to reflect on the relationship between the first half of the verse and the second, and so to pray rather than just to recite the words. Uh, I've come to the view that there are really only three kinds of parallelism, but that's because I take the third kind as a bucket catch-all for everything else. Uh, the first kind is what's usually called synonymous parallelism, where the second line basically repeats the gist of the first, but in different words. But of course, even synonymous parallelism is never mere repetition. The whole point of poetry is nuance, so that if you simply discarded the second half of the verse, you would have lost something. There is often a subtle development or intensification, so that the comparison between line one and line two is supposed to lead you to think new thoughts. So there's a good example in the first line, uh, the first verse of Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Clearly, heavens is parallel to firmament, and our telling is parallel to proclaims, but the glory of God isn't quite parallel to handiwork, so that it leads you to make the connection that the glory of God is manifest in his handiwork. Or take Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it, synonymous, he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers, synonymous. The second obvious kind of parallelism is usually called antithetic parallelism, where the relationship is one of contrasts or opposites. Take, for example, from Psalm 73, verse 26, my heart and my flesh may fail, but, and that's often a clue that a piece of antithetical uh, parallelism is on its way, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Or in Psalm 25 and verse 3, do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. And that leaves the um, third and vaguest category of parallelism, so-called synthetic parallelism. It's not as neat a category as those earlier two forms. Um, the, the essential marker is that the second line is some sort of a development uh, of the first. So Psalm 92 verse 1, it's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Or Psalm 115 verse 15, may you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. 
I, I, I find that a bit of attention to that simple feature in biblical poetry opens up all kinds of depths which might otherwise be missed. The second feature of Hebrew poetry which does survive translation is the vividness of its imagery. And again, once you're attuned to it, uh, you see it everywhere. It's very bold, typically very physical, and rather like the parables of Jesus, it draws heavily on everyday life. Again, like the parables of Jesus, the imagery remains powerful even in our culture, even though the exact images are no longer familiar to us from our everyday living. And again, like the parables of Jesus, the imagery is often an attempt to convey what God is like. It is the Lord who is like fresh water on a parched land, like a shield in battle, like a high rock in a sudden flood, like a sheltering wing. But the point is that the Hebrew dares to dispense with that word like. It just says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my shield, my stronghold. The Lord is a sun and a shield. And again, for the preacher, this is a treasure store and a challenge. What does the psalmist mean by calling God a sun? It demands imagination as well as discipline, and discipline as well as imagination. Then thirdly, there are a pair of what I call structural markers, word patterns, which help to give shape to a poetic text. Um, it's always worth paying attention to repetitions, uh, to distributions of words. Um, in the Psalter as a whole, for example, the distribution of terms for God, whether Elohim, God, or Yahweh, the Lord, uh, is very telling, very significant. It's one of the reasons why we know that our 150 psalms fall into five books. In Psalm 104, I'll try to show how a repeated word is structurally significant and therefore poetically and theologically uh, significant. The great Jewish philosopher Martin Buber said, the recurrence of key words is a basic rule of composition in the psalms. The rule has hermeneutical significance. The psalm interprets itself by repetition of what is essential to understanding. And I think there are two particular features of repetition to look out for. Uh, the first is the so-called envelope or inclusio, a repetition that tops and tails a poetic text or a portion of a text. Uh, there are many psalms, for example, which both start and finish Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Psalm 113, uh, each of the last five psalms, for example. Sometimes, as in Psalm 118, a longer phrase is used. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. It's a piece of synthetic parallelism in verse 1, repeated at the end of the psalm in verse 29. Or take Psalm 8, which you'll know, uh, which begins, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth, and finishes with the exact same words. So these are called envelopes, repetitions which don't, um, repetitions which don't occur just top and bottom, but are embedded in the text, dividing it up, are uh, usually called refrains. And in Psalm 80, for example, you get this beautiful, elaborate uh, refrain. Um, in verse 3, the first time we hear it, it's just restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Then in verse 7, restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And then in verse 19, restore us, O Lord God of hosts. That let your face shine that we may be saved. Similarly, in Psalm 99, you get holy is he at the end of verse 3. Holy is he at the end of verse 5 and then climactically at the end of verse 9, the Lord our God is holy. Refrains are a relatively frequent feature um, of the poetic literature of the Psalms. Uh, you'll find examples in Psalms 39, 42 and 3, 46, 49, 56, 57. I could go on. So, 
There are three features of biblical poetry which are easiest to spot in an English translation, uh, for which careful readers of the Bible um, have no excuse for failing to observe, even if they have no Hebrew, and which is increasingly hard to imagine in a digital world, no access to Bible commentaries or other basic Bible study tools. But then there are um, three features which generally don't survive translation. Um, and I want to say a word about acrostics, chiasms, and word plays before I turn finally to Psalm 104. Um, first of all, then, acrostics, these are poetic texts where successive lines begin with successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And since the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters, that tends to mean that such poems have either 22 verses, like Psalms 25 or 34, or some multiple of 22, like Psalm 119 with its remarkable 176 verses, with each chunk of eight verses all beginning with the same letter before the psalm moves on to the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, psalms 9 and 10, 37, 111, 112, 145 are all acrostic psalms. So does it matter theologically to recognise an acrostic psalm? Does it matter if it's lost in translation? Does it help with interpretation? Or does it change the meaning if you do or don't have that piece of information? Well, it has to be worth asking why the psalmist might have chosen that form for this particular composition. So in the case of Psalm 119, for example, which is an extended meditation on the word of the Lord, I think it's pretty clear that the psalmist is intending to say, here is my best effort at a comprehensive meditation on the testimonies and statutes of the Lord, an A to Z, if you like, relishing and cherishing of the word of God. Secondly, there are psalms or parts of psalms which exhibit a second feature, um, sometimes but not actually always lost in translation, called a chiasm uh, or a palistrophe, a feature where two or more parts of a text are reversely parallel or symmetrical. The word chiasm comes from the Greek letter chi, which is shaped like an X, and this feature um, is one in which a series of words or phrases occurs first in the sequence A, B, C, and then is repeated in the sequence C, B, A, symmetrically around the centre point. I am counting this as a, a feature which is lost in translation, because most of the chiasms in the Psalms are indeed lost uh, in translation, but I'm going to illustrate it actually with um, some instances in which the um, chiasm has survived the act of uh, translation. That's really just um, to enable you to follow me more closely. Um, uh, but I guess that for every one example that does survive the act of translation to English, there are three uh, which are lost. So um, chiasms might be line by line, um, as in this um, example from 120, some 127. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare has broken and we have escaped. Similarly, in Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. But chiasms can play out over much larger chunks of text. I am convinced that the whole book of Esther is a very tidy chiasm. That's a, a talk for another occasion. Um, here I'll offer you a couple of examples which involve whole psalms. Uh, here's Psalm 8, uh, for example. Uh, this is the one with the envelope. How majestic is your name, O Lord, in all the earth? In verse 1, also at the end. But if you come in from the ins uh, outside, um, verses 2 and 3 um, are, are focused on the rule of God. Verses 6 to 8 on the role God has delegated to humanity. Verse 4 is about the minuteness of humanity uh, in the sight of God, and yet verse 5, the dignity um, of humanity uh, in the sight of God. Um, one that's almost lost in translation is in um, Psalm 30, um, 
doesn't come over too clearly on the screen, I'm afraid. Um, but in the first five verses, I've highlighted the words rejoice, gone down to the pit, and favour. That's verses one to five. Rejoice, gone down to the pit, favour. If you look then at verses seven to twelve, the order's reversed. Favour, go down to the pit, enjoy, rejoice. In Hebrew, it's the, uh, uh, it's the same. And together, those features are intended to draw our attention to the middle line of the psalm. As for me, I said in my prosperity, um, I shall never be moved. It's a, it's a, it's a misjudged a misjudged statement of confidence uh, by the psalmist, which the psalmist in the second half of the psalm um, reflects, uh, reflects on and, and comes to um, think better of, uh, but our attention is drawn to it by the um, chiasm, I think. Uh, or take, finally, um, Psalm 67, um, another psalm with a very clear refrain. Uh, you can see it in bold uh, in verse 3. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. Word for word repeated in verse 5. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. That's unarguable, even in English. And since there are two verses before verse 3, and two verses after verse 5, verse 4 is already isolated as the centre and focus of the psalm. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. That's also, by the way, the only triad in the psalm, uh, all the other um, verses are two, uh, two lines long. But then notice in the, um, in the opening two verses, may God, in the last two verses, may God bless us, bless us, um, earth, earth. So it's again a neat and tidy uh, chiasm, I think. As it happens, this psalm introduces us to another feature which doesn't survive translation, and it's this little word, selah, at the end of verse 4, and you'll see it again at the end of verse 1. The word comes 71 times in the Psalms, and three more times in the book of Habakkuk, and no one has the slightest idea what it means. If someone tells you with confidence that they know, then they're kidding, even if they don't realise they're kidding. It seems to derive from the same Hebrew stem as the verb to rise, and it seems to be some sort of rubric or instruction, since it occurs mostly at the end of a line and seems not to interrupt the sense of the psalm. But whether it's a musical instruction, like up the volume here, or up the key here, or a liturgical instruction like stand up here, no one knows. Finally, um, a series of uh, three word plays um, which uh, abound uh, in the Psalms, and then I'll turn to um, Psalm 104. Um, these word plays are a sheer delight in biblical Hebrew and really don't survive the act of translation. And before this morning, before hearing Bishop Stephen, um, I was going to say that they really don't matter from a theological point of view. Um, but now I, I'm not so sure because they are beautiful. And if they're beautiful, then they do matter from a theological point of view. There are three most uh, obvious kinds. Um, the first is alliteration, uh, where the um, initial consonants repeat. Uh, in English, Simon says, seek salvation. Um, take the opening verse of Psalm 121. In English, it's pray for the peace of Jerusalem, uh, which is lovely enough. It's not difficult to understand. Knowing that Hebrew isn't a great advantage, as far as I can tell, in helping you interpret the words. But if you want to relish the words, how about this? Sha'alu, shalom, Yerushalayim. All those sh and l sounds, Sha'alu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Secondly, there's assonance, uh, where a vowel sound um, is repeated. Call, call, small uh, would be an example in English. Uh, the very opening words of the Psalter uh, in Psalm 1, uh, in English, it's blessed is the one who. In Hebrew, Ashri, 
Ha'ish Asher. Or in Psalm 113, that he might sit him with princes, uh, with the princes of his people. In Hebrew, it's Leho Wasabi Im Nedibim Im Nedibi Aman. And you just hear the, uh, the, the, the flowing sound um, of the syllables uh, in a beautiful way. Um, finally, finally, um, paranomasia or punning, um, two words which sound identical or um, at least have um, uh, sound alike but have very different meanings like um, bow uh, in English uh, or bark uh, in English. Um, so for example, in Psalm uh, 96 verse 5, all the gods of the nations are but idols. Well, the word for gods in Hebrew is Elohe. And the word for idols is elilim, and it's intended to be a, a pun. Or this in Psalm 18, verse 7, the English is the earth trembled and shook, but in Hebrew, trembled and shook is watigash, watirash. Hebrew has a special capacity for this, because most nouns in Hebrew are two syllables long, often with a hard consonant at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, and a vowel sound in between. So you get words like um, thing, debar, fool, nabal, and if you put them side by side, you've already got the makings of, uh, of poetry. Derek, way, melek, king. Uh, in the Bible, where you read a reference to the king's highway, it's derek, melek. You can hear the poetry. Kesef would be another word which goes with melek quite well. Shalom, peace, kabod, glory. Uh, the potential for punning um, is huge. It may not be crucial to the sense to understand the poetry, but it does honour the text uh, to be aware of its beauty, it seems to me. You've been very patient um, and indulgent. Uh, let's finally turn to a specific piece of poetry. Uh, this is Psalm 104. And um, to begin, I want to change gear um, I'm not actually a great fan of The Sound of Music, uh, but perhaps you remember Julie Andrew, Andrews and a few of her favourite things. Um, raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and soft woolen mittens. To be honest, none of those four... What? What did I say? Soft. You see, I don't... I don't, I don't I'm, not a big fan of the sound of music, but there are clearly a lot of you here. Um, to, to be honest, um, neither raindrops on roses, nor whiskers on kittens, nor bright copper kettles, nor warm woolen mittens would make my list of favourite things. But let me give you ten of my favourite things in no particular order. Almost any ball sport played with skill in the right spirit to a tense finish. Snorkeling in the warm waters of a tropical sea surrounded by fish of breathtaking colours. A good thriller, whether as a book or a film. The music of Johann Sebastian Bach on the one hand <laughs> or Bob Dylan on the other. The paintings of Caravaggio and El Greco. A glass of craft beer at the peaceful end of a busy day or a fine, dry, white wine. That's not a hint. <laughs> Tis now. <laughs> Lazing about under a hot blue sky. Travelling to new places with time to explore. A Friday rest day spent with Cathy, my wife. Good food shared with friends and family. Those are ten experiences which never fail to make me feel glad to be alive. And you may have noticed that not one of them has anything directly to do with God, let alone church. None of them is an obviously spiritual activity. 
certainly all of those things might be equally enjoyable to someone who's not a Christian, not a believer of any kind. Of course it's true that I could add another ten favourite things which relate very directly to my faith and to church, and if I'm honest and was drawing up a strict list of my absolute top ten favourite things, some of the following five would definitely get in. Advent Sunday, Easter Sunday, Christmas Eve, even Ash Wednesday. Bible reading, especially supported by a new and insightful Bible commentary. Hymn singing and Mozart's Sparrow Mass. The moments in ministry when I discover yet again that the Lord is a step or two ahead of me, or has answered a prayer I haven't even got around to praying yet. Seeing the penny drop in a new believer that they are loved by God, and so on. But here's the point. Psalm 104 warns us against assuming that a truly spiritual person will cram their top ten list of favourite things with narrowly spiritual experiences, whereas only a worldly person would include ordinary, everyday, human experiences. On the contrary, Psalm 104 tells us that a fully mature spiritual person will embrace the breadth of human experience and relish it in grateful thanksgiving to God. It follows, in other words, from a belief that a good God has made a good creation, that we will savour that creation as fully as we can, celebrating it, rejoicing in it, squeezing every ounce of pleasure out of it. Psalm 104 asks us if we are already doing that, and gently prods us, if not, why not? So it's a tragedy, I think, how narrow we Christians can become. Narrow and churchy in the company we keep. Narrow and churchy in the books we read or the films we see. Narrow and churchy in the activities in which we engage. Narrow and churchy in our view of what is important to God. Narrow and churchy in the things that we pray about. Part of the point of Psalm 104, part of its challenge, is to open us up to a breadth of living which is as wide and good as the good creation of God itself. I'll try to show you what I mean. The psalm on your handout is printed in five parts, and there's a good reason for that. There is a careful progression through this psalm, which is a celebration of what God has made, and there is a Hebrew verb for to make, asar, to create, which occurs in all five parts. Unfortunately, it's translated, and this is the problem with Hebrew poetry and what gets lost in translation, that verb asar is translated with different English words in most translations so that the pattern is disguised. So I've marked the references on the handout. Um, if it's still not clear, you'll just have to take my word for it, that the word is distributed through this psalm in a way that looks careful. I'll say again, of course the Bible is always more than carefully crafted literature, but it is seldom less than that, and Psalm 104 is yet another case in point. If it's a carefully crafted piece of writing, we should do the service of recognising it by the carefulness of our reading. You'll see that the first and uh, fifth sections of the psalm are the shortest, at just four and five verses long, and they mirror one another. They're not quite an envelope, but almost. They're linked, as those of you who are at the development day might recall Psalm 103 is also enveloped by the phrase, bless the Lord, O my soul. That is an envelope which recurs right at the beginning and right at the end. But those first and last sections are also linked by a vision of God in God's awesomeness. The reference to flaming fire in the first five verses, uh, four verses is linked to um, a reference to smoke uh, in the last part. 
If you come in then from the outside sections, sections 2 and 4 are longer at 9 and 7 verses, and those also mirror each other. These two sections are linked by a particular focus on water. In the second chunk of the psalm, God turns the death-dealing danger of flooding into a life-giving source of refreshment for creation. And in the fourth section, God tames the oceans, turning even Leviathan, the scary sea monster, into a plaything, sporting in the waters like some sort of cosmic bath toy. And since the first and last sections and the second and fourth sections mirror each other, it means that this psalm too is a chiasm centred on verses 14 to 23. At 10 verses, this middle section of the psalm is the longest, and it's also the only section of the psalm in which humanity plays any part. Now, you could rightly say, I think, that this reflects the psalmist's sense that from God's point of view, his human creation stands right at the heart, right at the centre of creation. But even so, it's worth noting two other things about the references to humans in this third section. The first is that although we do feature right at the start of that section in verses 14 and 15, and right at the end of that section in verse 23, that's it. Even in this central bit of the psalm, it's not as if the human race dominates the picture. We share it with trees and birds and goats with the sun and the moon and lions. It's rather like Genesis 1, where the first blessing is not the one to humanity in verse 28, but the one relating to animals six verses previously. And the second thing to note about the part that humanity plays in this central section of the psalm is that when the spotlight does fall squarely on the human race, the particular things that the psalm picks out as worth celebrating before God are not obviously spiritual things. In verses 14 and 15, it's plants for us to use. In particular, the three great crops of ancient Israel, grapes, olives and grain. And what are these plants for? Well, verse 14 says they are for food. Thank God for that. But verse 15 is more surprising. Grapes give us wine, it says. Why? Not as St. Paul puts it in his letter to Timothy, for your stomach's sake, not because it's particularly good for you, but because it's enjoyable, because it's fun. Wine to make the heart glad. Now I note that the Bishop of Chelmsford was not intending a dry Lent, even in his own particular definition of what a dry January might involve. Um, but some of you may be intending, as I am, uh, to abstain from alcohol during Lent. Um, but if so, perhaps with me, when you get home tonight, you will pour yourself a glass of wine and enjoy the gladdening of your heart as God's good will and purpose for you, his intention for you, because that's what this verse invites us to do. Or take olive oil, what might that be for? Well, for cooking, surely. Not in this psalm. The psalmist focuses on oil for anointing. Oil, you could almost say, for makeup, for men and women, actually. Oil to make the face shine. Oil as a facial beauty product. And bread? Well, even that is to strengthen not just the body but the heart. It's about our emotional mood, not just our physical head. And then look at verse 23, a classic piece of synthetic parallelism with a nice development in the second half of the line. People go out to their work, to their labour, until the evening. What the psalmist celebrates there is the God-given dignity of human activity. This is about 24-7 discipleship. 
It's not about Sunday worship only. It's about setting God's people free, if you know that recent report of the Archbishop's Council. It's a reminder here that it's not just on Sunday, not just in our worship, not just in our church-based activities, that we, um, we honour God and glorify God. Not just those activities which count before him, but Monday to Saturday, our employment, our volunteering, our home-based, community-based commitments, what we do every day matters to God. He is the one who causes the sun to shine, who heralds the dawning of the new day, and in the rising of the sun, God says to us, today is a new gift for you. What are you going to do with it? And what's interesting to me about the second and fourth sections of the psalm is the sense that it's not just we humans who are invited to celebrate before the Lord. In verse 12, when the birds of the air sing in the branches, isn't the psalmist inviting us to see their song as a song to their creator? Much as in verse 33, the psalmist himself will say, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Or take verses 27 to 29. All creatures, it says, including the sea creatures, but I, I think also the lion and the coney from the middle section of the psalm, these all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. I love that picture of the open-handed generosity of God, the bountiful goodness of God towards them, the animals, and not just towards us, the human race, but also that picture of creatures looking to God and the image that when God hides his face from them, these creatures are dismayed. Each in their own way knows itself to be in relationship to the creator, loves God's face and is downcast when God's face is withdrawn. And so in the final section, there are two things I want to invite you to note. The first is the way that the psalmist prays that God himself will rejoice in what he has made. That's the way the world is meant to be. We are supposed to rejoice with all creation in what God has made. And God is meant to be able to rejoice in his works. This whole psalm is, I'm confident, a meditation on Genesis 1. And verse 31 in the psalm picks up, probably coincidentally, verse 31 of Genesis 1, where we're told God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That wonderful vision of God rejoicing in his creation as it rejoices in him is a glimpse of God's coming kingdom. One day, when the kingdom of God is fulfilled, when the reign of God is all in all, one day the whole universe will be characterised by mutual rejoicing. God will look upon his creation with pleasure and delight and his creation will return the favour. The line, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live, I will sing praise to my God while I have my being, anticipates that great day. I'll sum up and shut up. Psalm 104 encourages us in our prayers and in our day-to-day -day living to marvel at the goodness, the beauty of God's creation, to enjoy the flowers and the trees, to enjoy the nature documentaries on the telly and the relationships we have with our pets, the walks in the mountains, the cruises on the sea. It pleases God, in other words, when we stop to smell the roses. More than that, verse 15 seems to me su to suggest that it even pleases God when we find pleasure. Assuming, of course we mean, forms of pleasure which honour our own health and well-being and the health and the well-being of others. It pleases God when we find pleasure. <coughs> and that, it seems to me, finally, is the point in the last section of the psalmist prayer that sinners might be consumed and the wicked blotted out of creation. 
The goodness of God's creation is spoiled by human selfishness, by our rejection of the kingship of God. And the psalmist longs for the day when God will blot out everything that blights the beauty of this world and perfects it, makes it what it was always intended to be, destroying all that spoils, destroying all that threatens to destroy. I don't think this is the psalmist pointing his finger at others and saying, Lord, he's a sinner, blot him out, she's a wicked one, let her be consumed. In fact, I suspect there's a hint that the psalmist is saying, Lord, I know what a sinner I am capable of being. I know what selfishness there is in my own heart. Please don't abandon me to the full consequences of my self-will. Blot out the sinner in me. Consume the wickedness in me so that I can find my rightful place in your glorious creation, looking to you, my generous king, my bountiful creator. Help me to find my rightful pleasure in you and in what you have made, for you are the source of all beauty and blessing. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen.